25 million people continue to be exposed to asbestos in the workplace. So there's a big cost to you using asbestos in dollars and lives. Research that goes into these decisions has to be directed by independent, unconflicted scientists. It's not something that just affects workers, it affects everyone. Saving one life is great, but saving many more is what I hope to accomplish. Making a profit off of people's pain and lives is wrong. We can't quit, not as long as there are hundreds of thousands of people still to be diagnosed. Ban the asbestos once and for all. So I am from Canada. Uh, and I grew up in small town Saskatchewan most of my life. Uh, we moved around quite a bit actually because my parents owned small town hotels most of my life. And this is little old me. This is exactly when I was exposed to asbestos in my grandparents' home. Um, my grandparents had a 1950s home in a small town called Tantau and, and my father was uh, the jack of all trades. He did everything from plumbing to construction and took a lot of uh, putting a new addition on my grandparents' home. Crawling around uh, as a little kid, fingers in the dust, hands to mouth. 35 years later, my worst nightmare came true. September 11th, 2014, I was diagnosed with, there is no staging, but it was pretty much end stage, peritoneal mesothelioma. I uh, had entered a small town hospital with abdominal pain and had a x-ray done and they sent me to a little bit bigger town of 8,000 people, which I wasn't pleased with, but had to go. And uh, they proceeded to do a CT scan with and die. And uh, the doctor had come back and advised me that I had an ovarian cyst rupture, and he was going to laparoscopically go in and remove it. Thinking it was only an ovarian cyst rupture, I thought, I'm here, let's do it. So the next afternoon, I went under the knife uh, the doctor laparoscopically went in, and uh, this is where my medical nightmare begins. So when I wake up and come into to the, the room where you're coming out of anesthetic, I wasn't even out of anesthetic, and all I got was, you're riddled full of cancer. And I noticed I'd been cut from the belly button down. And all I could do was cry. That's pretty much the natural reaction when, when you find out you have cancer. So the doctor decided to go on holidays and leave me with an 82-year-old resident, or 82-year-old and a resident. And over a period of five days, I got accused from everything. I was passing out from morphine and gravel on IV and got accused from taking more medication, which my medication was with my nurse. <laughs> but uh, over a period of five days, I had some x-rays because my stomach eventually started to balloon up like it was nine months pregnant. And finally, I, I just got mad at my charge nurse, and I was like, I'm a person, you know? There's something wrong. And they did another CT scan, and I was rushed on to another hospital because the doctor had stapled my intestine in my enclosure. So I was rushed for an incisional hernia repair and bowel obstruction to the bigger city that I should have went to, first of all. Looking back four years after, I found out that the cancer was on the CT scan that night. It was everywhere. And the doctor could have told me and had time to transfer me to a bigger center. Trying to play hero with somebody's life, not knowing what you're dealing with, is it's irresponsible and unforgivable in my eyes. So after I went to Regina, they did another biopsy, because the first biopsy from the small town came back, carcinoma, ovarian carcinoma. And when I was rushed for that second surgery, they did a biopsy to a bigger center, and it came back mesothelioma my mouth hit the floor because I know what asbestos is because my father worked with it. Many different products. We just didn't know at the time in 1978 that it caused cancer or my dad never would have had me around it. So moving on, I was at the cancer center in Regina and uh, October 17th, this is my father here with me. He's my best friend and my hero my whole life. But I went alone to the cancer center to find out that I had mesothelioma. And it was very hard, very hard. Instantly, my mouth hit the floor and the doctor's like, I think you have months to live. It was fairly bad. And I uh, asked if there was any options and he said we could try standard chemotherapy of car carboplatin and cisplatin. 
and as well he would send a surgical referral to Calgary in Alberta, which is a, a bigger center. So October 23rd, I started chemotherapy and I had three rounds of standard chemotherapy and in 10 weeks I lost 73 pounds and was admitted to the hospital after every treatment with no improvement other than needing blood transfusions and a lot of medical care. I kept asking the doctor how long I had to do this for because it wasn't doing anything. I asked where the surgical consult went and uh, he had no answer for me so I called the cancer center December 4th and I said I want to know who this surgeon is. Everything that I've read, I've researched says I need citro reductive surgery in HIPEC. That standard chemotherapy doesn't work in every case of peritoneal especially considering mine was so far advanced. So I called the cancer center and I, moved, uh, I flew out the following week because they had told me October 18th they had sent a pre-chemo consultation and uh, a scan and they wanted to see me and the doctors in Regina ignored it for three months. So the doctor on the phone said to me, you should have been here months ago. You don't have time with your cancer. I jumped on the next plane, I did my own dime, I was going. I needed hope, I needed something to hold on to. And uh, Dr. Wally Temple, he's one of three in Canada that I believe is a specialist in mesothelioma. And I've searched for doctors in every province. Uh, he's the head professor of oncology. He's the was the chief of staff for 29 years. And he took me under his wing like his daughter. So five months later after diagnosis, I finally went under the knife. There was a 25% chance that I would end up with an ileostomy bag as the cancer had spread in that five months further. This is one of my beautiful photos in the hospital. It was, uh, I look back on it and I want to cry because I look where I am now. I turned my negative situation into a positive. I fought for my life, which I find many meso patients can't because they're older or they don't have the resources or the energy. And don't ask me where I get mine. I, it comes from nowhere. <laughs> I fly all over the world. I help people in any way that I can. Uh, I flew with patients for surgeries. I have talked to patients in the middle of the night from the United States, from Europe. I've met other patients. The first time meeting Linda, <laughs> it's, which is absolutely an honor. So I went under the knife, and you'll look at me when I say this and you'll be like, how are you here? <laughs> I lost my gallbladder, my appendix, my ovaries, my tubes, my cervix, my uterus, my omentum, all of my colon, 19 feet of small bowel, part of my liver, part of my bladder, half my stomach lining and diaphragm. I now have seven feet of small intestine and an ileostomy bag on my stomach. My life looks easy, but on the daily, it's a struggle. Everything has changed from what I eat, to what I wear, to the confidence that I felt within myself. I don't know, but I can tell you this, my children, the love of my children, is the reason that I am still here today. And the graceful hands of a surgeon who believed in me, and who is still my friend to this day. He's now retired and teaching surgeries in Guatemala for free, but he answers every single email, every phone call. He fights for me when I was down on weight. In my province, um, I needed IV nutrition, and that's $50,000 a month. My province let me lose 40 pounds, uh, which is really, really devastating for me because I haven't come back from it um, before they would give it to me. The cost of treating mesothelioma to them is astronomical, but they don't invest the time in people as far as I'm concerned. The doctor that, that uh, ignored my referral no longer works at the cancer center. I refuse to work with any oncologist there because their same standard treatment is when it comes back, really, you're going to have chemotherapy. I said, no, I'm not. So thanks to some good friends down in the United States and some helpful doctors, I've been offered treatment in the United States for free when my mezzo does come back. I am lucky being as far gone as I was that I'm still here today and I have an astronomical fight with Linda, with the other people that I work with 
And in my mind, saving one life is great, but saving many more is what I hope to accomplish and do. I work with Jesse Todd in Saskatchewan and Sandy Kennart across Canada. And if we all join forces, one voice with many people is way bigger. So I hope that uh, the stuff that we're working on in Canada will come forward and I'll have many more years. I have four, my goal is five.